So uh, we'll begin the last lecture for the day, uh, this session. So um, Tao Liu will be speaking. He's a professor at Boston College. He obtained his PhD from uh, Caltech in 2000. His advisor was Dave Rabai. And uh, today he'll be talking about here the splittings of three manifolds. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for the, uh, for the invitation. So, uh, uh, so today I'm going to talk about figure splitting. Uh, figure splitting is one of the most basic structures uh, in three manifolds. Um, it was defined by Paul Vigar over 100 years ago. And uh, uh, in, a, in a paper, in the 1987 paper, Catherine Gordon introduced uh, a powerful concept called the strongly reusable Vigar splitting. And uh, uh, it led to uh, tremendous progress in instrumental topology. So this talk, I'm going to uh, uh, only to talk a, a few uh, of those uh, progress that, uh, uh, because of the strongly reusable Vigar splitting. So, uh, give you the definition of strongly reusable Higar splitting and some basic properties, and then I'll talk about some relation uh, with uh, normal surface theory, and, uh, and some, some work I did down in that direction, and then uh, I talk about some recent, uh, uh, recently the, how people can use the curve complex to study Higar splittings, and then that lead, that uh, lead the, the uh, the solution to the so called right first minus conjecture for hyperbolic manifold. And in the last time, I'm going to say a few words about uh, the connection to this surgery or not. So, uh, uh, handle body. So, the Higar splitting is basically splitting uh, into handle body. So, handle body is a three manifold with boundary. and uh, you can view this as uh, a neighborhood of a uh, finite graph in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. You, you, you take a finite graph, you thicken it a little bit so that you get a three-manifold boundary. So that's a handle body. And the fundamental group of the handle body is a free group. Uh, what's a Higar splitting? Higar splitting is uh, basically a decomposition of a three-manifold into a pair of handle bodies. And you have a embedded surface in your closely embedded or interval embedded surface in your three manifold, and on either side of your surface is a handle body. <coughs> so this definition is for closed three manifold, and for for manifold with boundary, you just basically use the same definition, just replace handle body with uh, something called a compression body. So what's compression body? Uh, you can think of the compression body as something. Well, you start with the handle body, then you delete something from your, your handle body, for example, because the handle body is the neighborhood of a graph. You can view this graph as the, as the core of your handle body. So if you delete a subset of your core, a small neighborhood of a subset of the core, and you, you don't want to delete the three ball, you want something non trivial. And then you get a compression body, for example, in this, in this, in this picture. Here I have a genus 2 handle body and I have this, uh, this, uh, this purple circle which is a part of the core graph of your handle body. Now I need the neighborhood of this, uh, this circle. So th this is the compression body. Now you glue a pair of compression body and also you view handle body as a special compression body uh, along the outside surface. Then you get a bigger splitting for manifold with boundary. And there's a classical theorem due to being a Moise, uh, the theorem says that every compact three manifold has a Higar splitting. Uh, <coughs> so actually, so basically, the, that also follows from uh, the result that every three manifold has a triangulation. If you have a triangulation, then you take a small neighborhood of your one skeleton, so that's a uh, that handle body, and because the dimension is a three, the complement of that handle body is also a handle body. So that gives you a Higar speed. So every three manifold has a Higar speed. Good. 
Uh, just like your triangulation, for example, your triangulation, you can get a fine and find the triangulations by doing subdivisions. And uh, similarly, for uh, Hagar splitting, you can generate a uh, larger and larger Hagar splitting by doing something called stabilization. So, what's a stabilization? Well, suppose you have a hand of uh, a Hagar splitting. Now, for, for this handle body, you can add a handle. So basically, in a small neighborhood of, uh, let's say, a point, you add a small handle, so you basically get a, a larger genus uh, handle body. And because here you add a handle, add a handle, so because outside is also a handle body, so with this, this operation, if you view that from the outside the handle body, it's like you're drilling out a tribute tunnel. So that also gives you a handle body. So basically here, this picture is the uh, original genus 2 handle body, I drill out the tunnel, so you get, again, uh, a genus 3 handle body. So this is called stabilization. And a uh, uh, key property of stabilization is that in this handle body, in the speaker speeding, for example, this, uh, this curve around this handle added, so this curve, but a disc basically fill in this hole, so this, this is a disc on the outside, and also the co core of this one handle, so this is the disc in this blue handle body. So those pair of discs basically intersect in one point. So that's uh, 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 whenever you have uh, Hagar splitting, if you can find a pair of discs on, on different sides, they, their boundary intersect at one point, then you know this Hagar splitting is obtained by stabilization of another Hagar splitting. So this type of uh, 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 Hagar splitting is called a stabilized Hagar splitting. So, so that means it's obtained uh, by this operation from another, uh, from another Hagar splitting. And uh, let me, uh, before I tell you what's a reducible and a strongly reducible Higgard splitting, let me uh, say just a few words about uh, the basic three manifold topology. And for any closed three manifold, there is some classical decomposition due to Nathan and Miller. So this is called uh, prime decomposition. Basically, you can decompose your manifold along essential two spheres into some prime cases, and this decomposition is unique and into the mechanical result. So this connected sum is this operation is basically you take your uh, your three manifold and now so you have two three manifolds in each three manifold you you delete a three digit in the wall you get a manifold with the sphere boundary then you glue the the boundary sphere together you get another three manifold so this operation of this operation generates a lot of also new three manifolds and uh, the sphere you glue on. Uh, well, unless your piece is, you start with it, that three is usually an uh, essential to sphere, definitely essential to sphere in this uh, three manifold. So, and for general three manifold, you have a, you have a, a unique to this type of decomposition. Uh, three manifold is totally reducible if, well, you do not have any essential to sphere. Every essential to sphere, every two sphere bound three to the ball. So basically, this is almost the same as a prime piece. And for orientable three manifold, and it's well, there's only one exception, which is the S versus one. So that's a prime piece, and otherwise, uh, this uh, uh, all the reduce, uh, all, all the, the prime cases are reducible. And there is another further decomposition. This is due to Jacob Schell and Johansen in the late '70s. It's called JSJ decomposition, and you can you have a canonical set of essential tori. You can uh, well, you first you assume your manifold is reducible. Then you have the canonical set of four I basically decompose your manifold into some uh, some canonical pieces, and this it basically is a setup for a uh, certain geometry addition conjecture, and uh, actually each piece after your uh, GSG decomposition has one of eight geometries. So that's uh, uh, briefly you can say for some three manifold quality. And now the reducible Higgs splitting is closely related to a uh, reducible uh, three manifold. Uh, what's a reducible Higgard splitting? A reducible Higgard, a Higgard splitting is reducible if you can find an essential simple closed curve on your Higgard surface that bound disk on both sides. For example, this red curve bound the disk in this blue handle body, and if you view this picture as in the uh, in S3, and this curve also bound the disk outside of the handle body. 
So this, if you have, if you have this type of curve, or well, this pair of disks share a boundary boundary curve, this uh, Eureka splitting is uh, is reducible. And um, if you do not have this type of curve, then it's uh, splitting is for the irreducible. And because you have a pair of disks, they share the boundary curve. So you know their unit going to give you a, a two-dimensional sphere. And if this two-dimensional sphere is a trivial to bound this three dimensional ball, and you know that inside your sufficient dimensional ball, and due to a theorem of Weinhausen, and this Higa splitting is sort of trivial, and if you if you the sphere bound the three dimensional ball, you know this Higa splitting is stabilized. That means you, that is obtained from another smaller genus Higa splitting by adding a trivial handle. And if uh, if this sphere is essential, then that means your three manifold is reducible. So that's the relation. And uh, so uh, a stabilized Higa splitting is always reducible. Uh, that's just like, for example, this picture. If you view this picture as uh, you start with this side first, add one handle, to one handle, so this sphere basically give you this uh, pair of disks. So uh, all the stabilized Higa splitting is reducible. And uh, this is a hacking snap says if your manifold itself is a reducible three manifold, then every Higa splitting is reducible. Okay? So the, the concept of the uh, strongly reducible Higa splitting uh, is uh, was introduced by Catherine Gordon. So this is a, a, a slightly weaker concept than the reducible splitting. So Higa splitting is called weakly reducible if you can pick, find a disk on each side so that the boundary curve that is showing. For example, this red curve around the disk in this blue handle body, and here this uh, this uh, this disk is out in the outside handle body, so those two disks are disjoint. So whenever you see this type of picture, uh, then this Higa splitting is reducible, and if you do not see this picture, uh, anywhere than this Higa splitting is called strongly reducible. And weakly reducible is really weaker than uh, the reducible because uh, if your Higa splitting is reducible, means you have a curve on the disk on both sides, you just uh, move, slightly move uh, one disk off the other disk, you basically get a pair of disks, the boundary disjoint. So <coughs> reducible Higa splitting is always weakly reducible and uh, uh, equivalently, a strongly irreducible Higa splitting is also irreducible, so it's really stronger. Uh, in the in the paper where they uh, introduced the strongly irreducible Higa splitting, they also show Catherine Gordon also showed that for non happy three manifolds, actually those two concepts are equivalent. Uh, a happy three manifold that we also mentioned uh, in the AS talk yesterday is a hacking stream manifold is a manifold, uh, a irreducible manifold that contains uh, uh, embedded essential surface or incompressible surface on a hacking stream manifold is a manifold without those type of surfaces. Okay, so uh, so this theorem basically is important uh, in, uh, in in two points. In two points, so let's, let's show that a lot of three manifolds Actually, canonically give you a strongly reducible Higa splitting. For example, if you start with a non hacking three manifold, then if you take a minimal genus Higa splitting, then by Gatling Gordon's theorem, you know that this Higa splitting has to be strongly reducible. Because it's not, uh, the manifold is reducible and it's not stabilized, so uh, it has to be strongly reducible. Now, for a hacking three manifold, and also this uh, theorem will give you a uh, uh, a uh, very interesting uh, construction of uh, uh, incompressible surface. Now, for Hacking three manifold, there is a, a theorem of Charlotte and Thompson in the early 90s. So they show that for any well unstabilized Higa splitting, for any unstabilized Higa splitting, there is a canonical set of incompressible surfaces in your three manifold that <coughs> divide your three manifold into several blocks. And in each one of the blocks, there is a strongly reducible Higa splitting. And the original Higa surface can be obtained by putting all those strongly reducible Higa surfaces together along 
the incompressible surfaces. So that's called amalgamation. And uh, so, uh, so this uh, theorem basically tells you that uh, even for Hacking's free manifold, there are a lot of interesting surfaces in your, uh, in your manifold that, uh, uh, that they can study. Okay, so uh, so we have uh, uh, gave the definition of Rayleigh units law. Take our speaking now why they're useful. The first application I'm going to talk about is uh, its relation to normal surface theory. So what's a normal surface? I'll start with a triangulation of your know, manifold. And, uh, this I mean the normal surface can also be defined using handle decomposition. So that we'll, we'll just uh, uh, use the uh, triangulation because the picture is much easier. If you have a triangulation, now in each tetrahedron, uh, there are a few type of disks, so the normal disk. So the first type is this type of triangle that cut out those vertices. There are four type of triangles, and also the second type is this quadrilateral. Basically, it separates this edge from this edge, and there's three type of quadrilaterals. So those are called the normal disks. Uh, a slightly slight generalization of normal disks, there is, uh, let me actually this picture is called uh, almost normal piece. Uh, there are two types of almost normal piece. The first type is simply you take a pair of normal disks, now you connect it using a tube. So basically you remove this from this triangle here, I remove a disk from another normal piece, now I add the annulus, basically what you end up is uh, embedded annulus. In this uh, in this type of region, I want this tube to be unknotted. So this is the first type of almost normal piece. The second type is the octagon. So this this curve is a single closed curve on the boundary of the type of region. It bound the disk inside. So this disk is uh, uh, is uh, uh, almost normal, also a normal, almost normal piece. Uh, in a, a surface in a triangular three manifold, it's the normal. If in each tetrahedron, after isotopy, in each tetrahedron, you only see this type of normal disk. So you intersect every tetrahedron in normal disks. And the surface is called almost normal. Basically, tell you, uh, basically said that the surface is normal, basically, except a single piece, which is either an annulus like this or uh, an octagon like this type of disk, except just one piece. Okay, why this is related to the Higgard splitting, and this is uh, there is a theorem uh, by Rubinstein and uh, also Stocking. So uh, they show that if you have a triangular three manifold, then every strongly irreducible Higgard surface is as topic to either a normal surface or an almost normal surface with respect to the triangulation. Basically, you can you have you have a very nice picture where at least locally picture of your of your Higar surface, a strongly reducible Higar surface. And they using this idea, uh, they uh, Rubinstein and Thompson, they gave an algorithm to decide whether or not uh, a three manifold is uh, three. So basically if you give me a triangle is three manifold, then this algorithm can tell you that your manifold is L3 or not. Okay? Uh, there's a natural relation between normal surfaces and the bright surface. The bright surface is the generalization of a train track. Basically, that's you have uh, a several small smooth pieces of surfaces that stack together like this. Uh, a normal uh, bright surface. If you take a neighborhood of your bright surface, you can all you can view your uh, neighborhood as this type of interval bundle over the bright surface. So here, those vertical lines, you can view them. As interval fiber, if you clap every interval, every interval into a point, you get back to the to the bread surface. And uh, so basically, uh, so this is sort of similar to the train track. To use the train track to study curves, we use the bread surface to study surfaces. And if your surface can be isotoped into a regular neighborhood of your bread surface, and so that the surface is transverse. To all the interval fibers, then we say the surface is carried by the branch surface. And why this is useful? Because then if your surface is carried by the branch surface, and we can translate the, the study of your 
uh, or the surface into uh, into a linear algebra problem. So basically, you count how many times each interval intersects the surface to get an integer. And so for each piece, you have an integer. Then those integers satisfy a certain uh, system linear equations. And if you have two pieces of uh, two embedded surfaces, although they may intersect, that there is a natural sum. Basically, you, so you cut and paste on, along the intersection curve. Basically, that's the integer point. You add it to another integer point. So that's a very natural uh, algebraic operation uh, uh, for uh, to study all the surfaces carried by the branch surface. And for normal surfaces, and you can construct only a finite number of branch surfaces such that every normal, almost normal surface is carried by one of the finite many branch surfaces. And uh, the reason is very simple because, it's, for example, for normal surfaces, it intersects each tetrahedron in in those are normal disks, and a lot of them are parallel. If you just stack all the parallel disks together, and then you get a branch surface. And you can, uh, because you only have finite different types of normal disks, you, you end up with only finite number of uh, branch surfaces. And using this uh, idea of branch surfaces, uh, a few years ago, uh, we proved that uh, uh, for what we really use for an h radius three manifold, and if you fix your genus, that your three manifold has only a finite number of PR spittings. Uh, and here, this is uh, is, uh, is important because there are examples like you have essential, essential pearls. You can, by spinning around your essential pearls, you can generate uh, infinitely non isotopic uh, uh, PR spittings of the same genes. So, uh, let me say uh, roughly how uh, the idea of the proof. So, the, the proof basically. Is that well? Because the strongly reducible Higgs splitting surfaces are carried by uh, uh, can be isotopic to a normal, 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 almost normal surfaces. Then you can use a finite number of uh, branch surfaces to describe your strongly reducible Higgs splittings. Now the key technical uh, thing in this uh, in the proof is to study all the tori carried by your branch surfaces. And uh, we know this is introidal, but it's still possible that, well, your tori, if it's carried by the branch surface, the hyperbound is solid torus in your three manifold. But, well, it's still possible that uh, the branch surface carries some tori. And then uh, the set of all the tori, they basically give you a special subset in the protected combination space. I won't tell you what that is. Um, I don't have to tell you what that is, but it's a compact subset. So the idea is that you find a way to split your branch surface further, further to get rid of those uh, uh, this subset, get rid of this compact subset. Then you end up with uh, a, a larger collection of branch surfaces and with that do not carry for us. Then, because of the mentioned the the, uh, the the surfaces carried by a single branch surfaces, you can view that using a lean system linear equations. So there's no tori, so when you add them together, and you, are, uh, you have two surfaces that together, their genus has to increase. And of course, there's no sphere, you can get rid of that easily. And so, so you, you, the finiteness only is just a simple calculation of all our characteristics. And so, this is uh, for, uh, for each genus, you have finite that uh, you can Oh, I've got to mention this. And you can, uh, you can modify the proof and uh, basically use this uh, uh, a modified version of the proof to give an algorithm to determine the Higar genus of three manifold. This algorithm is actually a good algorithm. It's basically just uh, for each genus you try to uh, try to list all the possible Higar surfaces and uh, you just keep listing and eventually you find the smallest the first one so that give you a that give you a, a, a Higar genus. And uh, so, if you if you if you, if you eliminate the the hypothesis of the fixed genus, actually, and for non hackers three manifolds, and uh, another term is uh, that you have only finite man many of uh, irreducible Higgs splittings altogether. So, if you your manifold is non hacking and there's only a finite number uh, of irreducible Higgs splittings. So this is like a sort of extension of the, the previous theorem, and the, the, the rough 
sketch of, uh, of this proof is that, well, you're basically starting from the clash on branch surfaces in the, in the previous theorem, and then, then you assume if one of the branch surfaces carry an uh, infinite sequence of strongly usable bigger surfaces, then you find the limit of a subsequence which will give you a better lamination, and then you just use the property of strongly reducible Higgard surfaces to show that this error lamination is also essential lamination, which implies that you manifold the attack. Right? Uh, on the uh, make a remark, and recently, uh, Cody and Gabai, uh, they gave a new proof of the, of the, of the non hacken theorem using, uh, using, using, using branch surfaces. Uh, sorry, using minimal surfaces. And how the minimum surface uh, is related to strongly reducible Higgard screen, that's uh, due to a theorem of uh, Rubinstein. Uh, they prove that if you have strongly reducible Higgard surface, then, then it's uh, basically it's almost as topic to a minimal surface, if we accept one, uh, one exception, which is uh, it's, uh, basically as topic to the surface, uh, well, uh, then you have to add one end. So basically that's the, 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 the starting point from their, uh, from their paper, just uh, that they analyze the minimal surface and give a new proof that the non hacking stream manifold has only a finite number of uh, uh, strongly irreducible, a uh, finite number of irreducible Higgard spin. Um, for the older example we know, all the example we know about uh, three manifold with infinitely many strongly reducible Higgard spinning, all those examples actually have a special feature, which is uh, you can construct an infinite number of strongly reducible Higgard spinnings using uh, an incompressible surface and with another strongly reducible Higgard surface. And they intersect, of course. Then you can basically add on some parallel copies of the incompressible surface. Basically, that gives you can gener uh, generate an infinite sequence of uh, strongly reducible Higgard splitting by using this uh, this is the sum. This is you add the surfaces together. So this is the so all the example we know uh, have this form. So in the in the proof of the theorem we just talked about in that proof we show that if you have an infinite sequence of uh, strongly reducible Higgard surfaces, then you have accumulation point which is uh, Mirror lamination, and uh, then you use that to conclude uh, that there exists uh, an incompressible surface that's not constructive. So the natural question in the in the final structure of the space of the, the space of the strongly reducible Higgard splitting is this uh, whether or not I mean this type of phenomenon always occurs. Okay, so uh, now I'm into. Uh, 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 say something about the, uh, how to use the curve complex, how the curve complex attack, uh, effect uh, uh, can, can be applied to study Higgard uh, spinnings. So if you have a closed article surface, and uh, here I use the genus 2 surface, and for genus 1 you have a similar de uh, definition, so the curve complex basically for as each isotopic class of each simple, essential symbol of curve, you assign a vertex, and two vertices you are uh, connected by a, a one simplex, if they're disjoint, and actually if you have several uh, vertices uh, represented by disjoint curves, you, uh, you assign a simplex to it, so you get a, a complex, this is called a curve complex. For torus, actually, this is the same as the paragraph, I won't uh, say more about that. Okay, and then the distance of two vertices is in one skeleton of your curve complex, you can see you go from one vertex to another vertex, you find the shortest path, the number of edges you, you cross, that's the, that's the distance. It's, uh, it's uh, always an integer. And for, for handle body, the boundary surface is, uh, let's say, a genus 2 surface, uh, also a genus uh, least 2 uh, uh, surface. Then the disk complex, if you look at all the curves that bound, bound disks, you handle body. So that's, uh, you can spin that into a subcomplex, so this is called a disk complex. And the, the distance uh, is defined by a handful of the Higgard splitting is, well, you have a common boundary surface of the, the two handle body have common boundary surface. 
Now, this is complex and this is complex, so their distance in the curve complex of the, the linear distance, so half of distance. And for instance, if the distance is zero, that means they share a vertex. If they share a vertex, that means you have a simple closed curve that's about the disk in both sides. So that means the Hilbert splitting is uh, reducible. So that's the equivalent to saying that the distance is zero, and the strongly reducible splitting is means that the distance is at least two for uh, for all the Hilbert splitting is except the length space, of course. Okay. Uh, so let me mention a couple of uh, more theorems. Uh, there's a theorem of Hashong. It shows that if you have, uh, if your three manifold have an incompressible surface, and the genus, then the genus of the incompressible surface is going to give you a bound of the Higars, of the distance of any Higar speaking of the three manifold, and the later this is uh, uh, this is generalized in a, in a much more general setting, basically for all the strongly, not just the incompressible surface, and also for all the strongly reducible surface means, strongly reducible surface means the surface compressed on both sides, then every disk on one side intersects every disk on the other side. Okay, and also the, the genus also bounds the, the, the Higar distance, and uh, so you can, you can feel this theorem uh, saying that if you, if you have high distance Higar splitting now, if you your Higar surface basically if you clap your Higar surface into a graph this side, then go to the graph on the other side. Now, because the Higar, the, the, the handle distance is are very, very large, then you have to sort of, uh, I mean, you have a lot of twisting going on to, to get to the other side. If you have a surface basically goes, go, goes through that, then you have to have a lot of genus to, uh, because of the, if, if the Higar distance is, is very large. Okay, uh, you can generalize this. Uh, as well as you generalize this uh, uh, Hamble distance uh, into uh, arbitrary amalgamation, if you have glue two manifolds together along a surface, then here for the two sub two manifolds u one u two can define a set of vertices to be the boundary curves of essential. Uh, uh, embedded uh, essential or interval surfaces uh, with the maximum possible order characteristics. For example, if the surface is compressible, the maximum possible surface is the disk. So now the distance, the mathematical distance, is basically you, you look at the distance between those two sets in the, in the surface. For instance, if this surface F is a bigger surface, now, because the disk is the maximum or has the maximum order characteristic, then this is the same with the handle distance. And uh, using this amalgamation distance, you can you can give uh, 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 a sort of generalization of the Hatchet theorem and uh, and the theorem of uh, Sharman and Tomova. So basically, it says that if you glue two manifolds in a very complicated way in terms of this type of gluing distance, then all the small genus Higar surfaces uh, are standard, so the standard with respect to the uh, lamp telescope. And in particular, you know the Higar, Higar genus of the, of the mock-mated manifold, so you can write down a simple formula. And so that's basically uh, sort of uh, give you a, a better understanding of the Higar genus and, and their and the gluing of uh, a sufficiently complicated map, and uh, so this uh, uh, we can use this formula because this tells the genus. Use this formula to to give a construction of uh, many useful examples. Okay. So let me let me say uh, uh, briefly say uh, the relation uh, between some uh, some basic relation between uh, Hinkar splitting and uh, fundamental group. Uh, so if you have a Higar splitting, now the core curve, core graph of one handle body, so that basically gives you a set of generator. Now in the second, the other handle body on the outside, you have a bunch of uh, desks that give you relations. So every Higar splitting gives you a natural presentation of a fundamental group. And the stabilization is simply, if you add the handle, you add the generator, and stabilization basically, I mean in terms of the, uh, the fundamental group, is just add the generator, then you kill this generator using this, uh, uh, so that basically doesn't change the fundamental group. Uh, uh, a very basic invariance of a 3 folks is uh, 
the minimum number of generators, so that's called the rank of the fundamental group. And the geometric, uh, geometric uh, invariant uh, in terms of Higar splittings is uh, uh, here is the Higar genus, which is the minimum possible genus uh, among all the Higar splittings. So because each Higar splitting gives you uh, presentation of a fundamental group, clearly the rank of fundamental group is smaller than the Higar genus. And there, is, uh, there was a question uh, back in the 60s. Uh, due to one house and ask whether or not those two invariants are the same. Okay, and let me give you a few examples. For example, if the rank is equal to zero, that will basically another way of saying that the fundamental group is trivial, then the manifold is S3, the genus is zero, so this is a concrete conjecture. So that's why that conjecture, that question uh, of one house and sometimes will uh, generalize the concrete conjecture. And for example, for the rank equal to 1, this band has to be a length space, so that's also true the rank is the same as the genus. And you can generate, using the general examples for Higar genus 2, any manifold with Higar genus 2, then the rank is the same as the genus. And also the recent example, uh, so this is a, a term of Hong Soto, it shows that if you have a fiber bundle and uh, if the model group is the high power of the mass of map, so that, uh, so, or another way of saying that, you can find uh, uh, a large cyclic cover, uh, it's a large cyclic cover of another fiber bundle, then the rest of the gene is the same, and there's a, another theorem of the model in Soto, basically shows the similar thing for Higar splittings. If you gluing map of your Higar splitting can be expressed at the high power of a uh, generic map then the rank and genus are also the same. So those two examples are hyperbolic manifolds. And uh, in fact the general uh, well for the general question the answer is no. Uh, there's a, a, a theorem of uh, in the 80s they find a cyber fiber space uh, which has a rank of fundamental group, group is equal to two but the Higar genus is equal to three and later, this example has been generalized by Shelton and Weinman. Uh, uh, they show that for certain graph manifold, they can actually, well, they're not equal, and actually can show their, uh, the difference of the two numbers can be actually large. Uh, so in case you don't know what a side fiber space is, a side fiber space can be viewed as a, as a circle bundle. Well, you already have to think of this as a circle bundle, but the side fiber space is you have a finite number of singular fibers, basically near the singular fiber, your regular fibers, basically going around the single, singular fiber maybe more than one time. And uh, a particular property of side fiber space is that it has a non-trivial center. Your, 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 your loop along your regular fiber basically commutes <coughs> every other element. So in the proof, of uh, borrow D chunk, so this is, uh, and also the Charles Weinman, so this is the key thing you do. You use the, the, the fact that this, you have this element to commute with every, everybody, so they can use that to find uh, uh, another presentation of a kind of group with a smaller rank. And then the natural question, of course, is whether or not this is uh, uh, the rank and the genus are the same for hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, Actually, the answer is also no. Uh, a couple of years ago, I proved that it actually for hyperbolic manifold, there are also examples that the rank is smaller than the Higar genus, and in fact, it can also do that, uh, making the genus and rank difference to be arbitrarily large. Uh, so, uh, so this is basically uh, actually use the 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 theorem we we, we just mentioned because that theorem gives you a, a formula for the computing the Higar genus, and uh, so once you know the Higar genus, you can construct some local thing uh, to try to reduce the rank and uh, try to uh, find uh, an example of your, of your, of your man, uh, manifold. Okay. Uh, so this, although the rank and the genus are not the same, then uh, there's some, uh, there's still some, uh, a lot of questions to be answered. For instance, we know the Higar genus is always bigger than or equal to the rank of the fundamental group. Now the question is whether you have another inequality, basically whether you can find a fixed function such that the function of the rank is always bigger than or equal to the, uh, the, the Higar genus, I mean, at least for hyperbolic manifold. And also, you can ask whether or not this function f can be a linear function. If it's a linear function, that means uh, the ratio 
have a goes to zero. So you ask whether or not the ratio of the rank and the index can be zero. In the example, I talked about the ratio of the same. And also the example we mentioned, uh, all, all the example we know about the manifold with the rank smaller than gigabit index, they're all happens to manifold. And there's a, a question whether or not the rank and the gigabit index are the same for, for non hackens to manifold. And then you can ask uh, the similar question about uh, not in S3 and the, whether the confidence of not in S3, uh, this uh, rank and genus uh, uh, are equal for, for, the, for the criteria of, uh, of non trivial not. And also, what's the minimum value of the rank if the rank is more than genus? And uh, we do not know whether rank 2 has only manifolds. Uh, uh, give you equality or not. Okay. And also, uh, there's a, an interesting relation uh, of the rank of the genus to another very old conjecture. So, if you have two closed stream manifolds, if there's a degree one map, then the conjecture is the Higar genus of this of the manifold M is always at least bigger, uh, uh, bigger than or equal to the Higar genus of the target manifold. And because there is uh, because if you have the degree one map, this map is subjective and on the fundamental group, actually the rank of M is at least bigger than or equal to the rank of N. Now the Higar genus is still not known, but I mean if you want to construct a counter example of the example, then this manifold N has to have this property, the rank has to be smaller than the Higar genus. So at least uh, whether or not it's possible to construct a counter example using the example we talked about. This is another relation. And by the way, the, the, the degree one map, that's conjecture, implies hundred conjectures. So I'm through that, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. Okay, so uh, I'm almost running out of time. Let me say a few words about the answer here on NAS. So if you, uh, if you consider NAS in F3 and, uh, and the exterior of the NAS, you can, talk, you can think about the, the Higar genus of the exterior of the NAS and uh, you talk about the relation between those Higar surfaces and the, the, uh, and the manifold after the lens surgery. So if you have a slope and if you get rid of the neighborhood of the NAS in a different way, so that's the lens surgery. And uh, so now the natural question is uh, whether or not it's possible to determine the Higar genus of the, the manifold after the lens surgery. And of course, there's a not copying the uh, theorem by Gordon Lucky. It shows that if the after the surgery is F3, then the surgery has to be in trivial slope. And that's F3, and you can ask whether or what happened if the, uh, if the after the surgery gets a lens space. And there's an observation of uh, uh, Berge. They show that if, uh, well, they observe they have simple closed curve on genus 2 Hikars splitting. And uh, if this curve is called doubly primitive, then that means if you do a then surgery, this genus 2 Higar splitting becomes genus 1 splitting, means the manifold is uh, a then space. And the famous conjecture of Berge is that, well, uh, is that if, if the conjecture that if, this is the Gordon, the conjecture that if uh, the lens space, if you get a lens space by doing a then surgery, then the knot has to be doubly primitive. And actually, there are a couple of uh, uh, questions, a uh, couple of theorem and conjectures, so that although the trivial surgeries, surgery basically reduces your manifold back to S3, but actually for other surgeries, it does not basically reduce your Higar genus. And this is the conjecture of uh, uh, Cameron Gordon, to show that for, uh, for not in S3, for any non trivial then surgery, the Higar genus not decreased by one. Uh, let me give you uh, say a couple words how the Higar genus can, can be reduced by the surgery. And this is uh, a notion of, uh, uh, of primitive splittings. A primitive splitting is if you have a Higar splitting of your nautic exterior, now if you can find a pair, one is a disc in your handle body, another is a spanning annulus in your compression body, if this pair intersect at this one point, that's called the primitive. And if you do a then surgery, basically you allow this slope, you basically this annulus extend to a disc. So after the then surgery, this annulus disc pair becomes the disc disc pair. That means your your Higar splitting is uh, stabilized. So 
that cannot be minimum, uh, minimum uh, genus. So if you, your Hegar splitting is uh, as primitive as after the surgery, and that's a very natural picture that how your Hegar genus is going to get reduced after surgery. And uh, let me just uh, do one last slide. So this is another conjecture basically says that in commerce, if you for any your surgeries, if your Hegar splitting can be reduced, then there is always a Hegar splitting so that this uh, basically that's the picture I described with the canonical picture. By the way, this conjecture implies the, the Bernie conjecture, at least for in the soup. For high genus, you have uh, a different uh, version of this conjecture. And, uh, and I would say it's uh, maybe possible to reduce uh, uh, those uh, Hegar splitting method to, to, to attack the, the Bernie conjecture from this one.